Live from Seattle, Washington, it's theCUBE. Covering DockerCon 2016. Brought to you by Docker. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Brian Gracely. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Seattle, Washington for DockerCon 2016. This is SiliconANGLE Media's The Cube. It's our flagship program where we go out to the events and extract the signal from noise. I'm John Furrier, my co-host Brian Gracely. Our next guest is Avinash Lashram, who is the co-founder of Hedvig, or founder of Hedvig, and the founder of Cassandra and Dynamo, former Facebook and I was CEO. one of the inventors of Dynamo. One of the inventors. No, no. Founder of Facebook, as <laughs> he's also known in circles. No, he's been <laughs> in Facebook and Amazon. Well, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, thank you. Um, you're kind of a celebrity in tech circles. Oh, thank um, you. Certainly a lot of experience. Um, really going through the early days of, you know, the web scale, you know, we call the pre-DevOps movement where you know, you're kind of making, you know, making your own stuff at scale. Now we got a little bit easier environment for developers. First question is, what's it like now? Look, look back then and now, what's changed the most in your mind from the you know, early days of, <coughs> of uh, the DevOps battles? You know, first off, thanks a lot for having me. Uh, and uh, for me, primarily, no matter what the titles get associated with me, I've always been thinking and like an engineer. I mean, if you see me in the office, I'll be one with the boys, right, yeah. doing stuff. So for me, it really didn't change that much mentally. And uh, I think the training I got was more at Amazon where when we built Dynamo and in Amazon, I, I believe it exists even today, uh, that the service owners are also the guys who are responsible for it operationally. Right? So we had pager duties and you get called in when there are outages or not and you, you got to figure everything out. There was no build something and hand it off to like a separate so DevOps. You, you build it, you run it. Exactly, yeah. exactly. That's the way I kind of like it, because when you build systems, you always go with a theoretical understanding of how you would solve the problem, right? But once you start running in a reasonable amount of scale, and you know, Amazon kind of puts it right out there, and later Facebook, uh, even with a larger scale, right? But the point being that you got to run these things operationally for you to understand how you can retrofit your designs to make your life easy, right? Making your life easy is the key to make things run operationally very efficiently. And, the, and at those days, you look at the Amazon, a bookstore, if you will, now Amazon Web Service, $10 billion business, Andy Jassy's kicking, taking names and kicking ass over there, and <coughs> now you got Facebook, which you, where you work, all applications in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. That's the norm now, people are moving towards that world where it's an application focus, then they dictate <coughs> infrastructure and software. That's the modern era we're living in, that's what you guys have based your business on. Yeah, see, if you, for me, depending, just like how things in life are relative, right? You, one can never claim he's the smartest, one can never claim he's the dumbest either, because <laughs> you're going to have a guy around the corner who's smarter than you are or dumber than you are, right? If you look at applications, Depending on which level of the stack you fall in, the guy above is an application, the guy below is not, right? So it just depends on, to a guy mm -hmm. who builds the operating system or if he's used to working in the kernel, you might be storage running in the user space, but you look like an app to him or her, right? So it's all relative in a, in a it's sense. It's kind of where you, your view, where you are mm -hmm. in exactly. the stack. Exactly, So how do you look at this, the trend of the horizontally scalable infrastructure? Because, you know, commodity, Hardware and cloud creates a horizontally scalable architecture, but yet apps are becoming purpose-built towards the top of the stack. So you got big data, kind of pre-packaged specialization, domain expertise, big data analytics, yet the commodity scalable, horizontally scalable is re the real value of some of the cloud stuff. How do you, as, and from a stack standpoint, what do customers do to deal with that? It used to be easy, just build a stack and that's your app. See, I think fundamentally, Hardware has come a long way in the last decade, right? And if you look at why people have started moving towards these horizontally scalable apps, the reason for that is that if you go back, say, 20 years, why did SAN come to be, right? People were creating islands of storage and it was becoming a nightmare to manage, right? So people came up with this idea of a centralized storage infrastructure one person could manage it, and all apps kind of get storage coming out of that environment, right? It was a good design, worked well for a long time, right? 
But if you look at how things are moving now, all applications are implicitly horizontal in nature, right? You take any database, it's not a monolithic piece of software. Yeah. You take HBase or Cassandra or MongoDB or DynamoDB, they're all kind of scalable in nature horizontally, right? If you now, what, do you, what people end up doing is now creating islands of storage because you cannot put them on a traditional SAN or a traditional NAS, right? Because all the scale out properties are lost when yeah. you go to a centralized storage infrastructure, right? Now, I came from that world where I built highly scalable, horizontally scalable kind of database-like applications, yeah. right? But what I learned was, if you look at what happens in storage, it's been no fundamental innovation in the last decade. <clears throat> right? There have been good companies, good exits, but they've all been kind of incremental yeah. in nature. There have been a, well, pure storage went public. Exactly. You can argue they're still overvalued, some say, but you know, they're the, since NetApp, that's the only one that's kind of like come out of the woodwork. Exactly, but if you take these scalable applications, they're creating islands of storage because of the monolithic storage environments that are in the market today. So what's the answer? What if you could take that SAN and make it a horizontally scalable, quote unquote SAN, right? Mm -hmm. Be it SAN or whether you, what you know, uh, protocol you expose doesn't matter, but as long as it can scale horizontally, now you could take the same idea of a SAN from like 10, 20 years ago and apply it in a modern setting, right? But you got to keep costs under control too and you want to keep things more flexible. So you want to run this on yeah. Off the shelf hardware. I mean, do, do, do the users, I mean, the customers care as long as they get the data, right? Well, I, I, mean, think, I think there's a really, there's a subtle nuance here. So what, I think what happens is, people hear things like, well, you know, I, I came from Facebook background or I came from Amazon background, and a lot of enterprise companies go, well, we're not like them. They, you know, they don't understand the applications. <coughs> but what happens, I think, is, and we've talked about this a ton, the key to these, these next types of things is you've got to take operational costs out of the system. Exactly. You've, got to, you've got to make that simple. And so what you're doing, we've seen Nutanix do this a little bit. They used to talk about, hey, we have all this Facebook or Google DNA. The customer doesn't have to see any of that. They exactly. want to see a block storage, a file system, and what you're giving them is essentially the DNA that you had at Facebook, the DNA exactly. you had at Amazon, and going, don't worry about it, but this will make it simple, it will make it cheaper. Is exactly. that where you're going That is exactly the way we want to do it, right? And, and if you, if the reason why almost every customer we have spoken to almost every single one of them has a mandate from above to look at alternative architectures for storage. It's kind of unprecedented, right? Even three years ago when I was out fundraising, something that I don't really like to do, but you know, you always get asked this, I was always getting this question. Storage will not move really fast, people are risk averse, et cetera, et cetera. But now, that question has kind of been taken yeah. out of the equation because everyone has an alternative. A look growth at alternative. in data alone has been pretty massive. Mm -hmm. The availability of data is the new currency. Exactly. And so, again, the premise, and then the developer growth is incredible. So, <laughs> make the data available, horizontal, and make the developer productive, productive on the app. Exactly. Not the plumbing. And we have taken this, I think, a couple of steps further, and I believe, uh, I mean, I'm willing to stand corrected, but I don't think apart from us, anyone is even close to doing this, which is, we can, span our cluster across different data centers spread geographically, no matter how far apart, right? Uh, so we have a customer that's basically running our software spread across four or five data centers spread uh, across two countries, right? And it's one cluster <coughs> that spans that. So you get DR kind of out of the box just by clicking a few buttons from a provisioning perspective. Right? Yeah. You can push that analogy even further. One of the data centers could be the public cloud since we are all software based. You could spin our software instances on AWS, and you can have an on-prem and AWS cluster kind of living on the same physical kind of you know, uh, cluster, right? Yeah. What's the big, big trending conversations that you've had with customers as they look at re-architecting and, and re-platforming their enterprises? They want faster development, we hear that all the time, but when they look at their overall architecture of their environment, what are the top conversations that you see? I think it's the simplicity of getting something up and running, uh, like how you would do things in an AWS-like environment, right? You go there, you don't wait for weeks for VMs to be provisioned, and most of the time, it's the storage provisioning that takes up most of the time. Right? If you go to AWS, it's a few clicks of the button here and there, and everything is done for you. And in order, on top of that, the kind of you know, policies that we allow one to enable on these storage assets that we give out to applications like 
across data center replication, pick and choose which data centers you want the data to reside in, et cetera, et cetera. And being able to do that literally through your iPhone, I think is a very potent premise for folks. Yeah. So when you were fundraising, what was the biggest challenge you had when you were going out? Because you were, back then storage wasn't that obvious. A lot of people were, were nervous. I remember those days. This NetApp was just kind of like, you know, not performing well, and EMC was sideways, and you know. You know, fortunately, I was kind of lucky in the sense that people were willing to take the bet on my past experience, right? And almost every round that I've raised so far was preemptively done, rather than me actively going and seeking. But still, the I bet think, on you. Uh, that was you. approach, and it was your approach too. You were you were betting that the world would move. Exactly, and, and the writing was, at least in my mind, on the wall. There are certain predictions that I made that I will never make on a public setting like this. <laughs> and they were all spot on a year later, right? And, and the trend that you see right now, if you look at what we set out to do and what we are doing now, we have been doing this for about four years. So make a prediction, come on. We never pivoted. <laughs> so whatever it is we are doing is the way to move forward. And I think what's going to happen going forward is that, see, I think ultimately there will be this journey that goes to the public cloud, right? and you will have people who would want to run across multiple public clouds, right? Because you don't want this vendor lock-in, right? Mm -hmm. If you go into one particular cloud environment, and if you start consuming the services that they have, you're locked in, your, your apps are locked into that environment. Now you get squeezed for price, et cetera, et cetera. It's easy to move compute than it is to move data. So we believe, and we have this capability today, which is if you could build a universal data plane that can reside across multiple cloud vendors, then you can move your compute willy-nilly, still get locality of access for data. I think that's where things will ultimately start And IoT towards. fits nicely into that. Yes. Uh, what about compliance? That comes up a lot. We hear, you know, well, you know, I love the organic sprawl of the data, the SAN kind of gets spread out. I love the elastic resources, horizontally scalable, you know, focused applications. Then it's like, Someone goes, damn, I gotta, can't forget the compliance question. Or in that regard, security. Exactly. So, I mean, compliance <laughs> and security kind of, it's a, it's a very big subject, right? I can't give a one line <laughs> crisp answer to how that problem just, just is. Just say yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we got, yeah. got it covered. No, yeah, but it, the compliance it is, is a little bit more of a blocking and tackling. Security could be technical, right? Exactly. I mean, some of the customers have asked us about whether we do encryption or not on the data that we store uh, you know, on our systems. There's multiple ways you can skin that cat, but some people may or may not kind of embrace that. You could use SCDs, like self-encrypting drives, and you could say that's the first step towards kind of providing encryption. Because the biggest problem with encryption is who does the damn key management, right? I mean, do we do it? I, I don't want to be in the business of doing that. But if every vendor has their own mechanism for key management, then there has to be some kind of an API that we can embrace so that we can drive that from our system. Yeah. Right. So the formula is, it's got to be software, you've got to be able to distribute your data anywhere because you don't know who wants it or gets it. It's got to have an API, Absolutely. And, and behind the scenes, it's got to have some pretty kick-ass technology to make all that stuff as simple as possible Absolutely. to the user. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, for the first time, uh, I'm sure a lot of people do this now, but we always claim that provisioning should be so brain dead simple that you should be able to provision thousands of virtual disks out of your environment for your, for your you know, VMs or bare metal or container environments. And it should be as simple as being able to do that through an iPhone. And we believe we bring that to the market. How many employees do you guys have now? Oh, less than 100 right now. So you're still small. Still small. Still, small. And still hiring though. Still hi what are you looking <laughs> for, for hires? Uh, from an engineering background? Yeah. I mean, mostly engineering. R&D is the primary focus still. Um, I mean, I'm looking for people who are extremely passionate about doing large-scale distributed systems. If they have the background, great. Um, different people have a different view on distributed systems. Not all the views kind of gel with my view of what distributed systems <laughs> should be. Uh, the most popular view is a piece of software runs on multiple machines, it's a distributed system. Not in mine. Uh, but even if people don't have that background, if they have the willingness to learn and if they have a good Systems background, more than happy to so systems, make that investment. Yeah, so you're systems mm. programmers. Yes. Founder-led, founder founder-driven, yeah, I mean, you a, love those kind of companies. I love founder-led companies, believe me, you know, because they really, because when the market changes, you got to have that kind of gut feeling, the bets you're making. Okay. As you said, you got to know the market. Final question, for the folks watching, just explain the, the, the Docker madness 
that's here because you know, the show's growing, leaps and bounds, very similar to AWS in the early days. Rancher Labs, this, containers here, Mesos, CoreOS, Docker, Kubernetes. It's, it's kind of noisy. How would you kind of break it down for someone who's not here? What's the big walk away? Where does it all fit? Hey, well, I wish you could give me the answer to that one. <laughs> We're right? working on it. But, <laughs> but for, from our perspective, I think uh, for us it's an integration with all these uh, various uh, you know, pieces of orchestration software that are available. We will go to bed with any one of them. Right? I mean, today we have... You're under the hood. You're just the infrastructure pool exactly. for them. We made three big announcements today. Right? One is our integration with ContainerX. They are the vSphere of containers. Right? They bridge the gap between running containers in a, in a VM environment, Linux or Windows. We did this whole announcement with Flocker. They provide persistent uh, container volumes. Right? And the whole integration with Docker Data Center, yeah. which is, I believe if it picks up, that will be the orchestration tool of choice. But they will be given a run for their money from Kubernetes because it's backed by Google and you know, Google. But that battle's being fought above you. Exactly. So you're under the hood, you win either way, because the word compose, composable, DevOps, it fits right into your wheelhouse. Exactly. I mean, it's, uh, you know, there's a quote that I've read, and I try to use it whenever I can. And so guys who know me know that I'm going to try to sneak that in. Yeah. You know, it's uh, Victor. They have a bad taste to get it in or not. <laughs> <laughs> Victor Hugo said, uh, no army can withstand the strength of a of an idea whose time has come, right? I think what we are doing, the time is now. So it's, it's for us to fail, and I think if we execute, yeah. we could be the number one in this space. Yeah, and I think that's a great charge. Thanks so much for sharing the insights here in the Cube. Really appreciate it. Congratulations you. Thank you. on your startup. Hedvig is doing really extremely well. We are the co-founder. We'll be back right back with more live coverage from DockerCon. I'm John Furrier with Brian Gracie. You're watching the Cube.